test, 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 test. One, two, three, mic test. One, two, three, Mr. Collins, Mr. Meadows.
This uh, committee will come to order. Pursuant to notice, we meet today to mark up four strongly bipartisan measures by the committee here, and because there are four other full committee markups going on at this same time, and because these measures enjoy such broad support here on the committee, the ranking member and I intend to proceed according to the expedited procedure emailed uh, to your offices yesterday. So without objection, all members may have five days to submit statements for the record and any extraneous materials on today's items. And I now call up H.R. 4490. The clerk will report the bill. H.R. 4490, a bill to enhance the missions, objectives, and effectiveness of United States international communications and for other purposes. Being so without, enacted. So without, without objection, the, the bill is considered read. And I now recognize members for opening remarks on this bill, beginning with myself and beginning with the ranking member. And so let me begin by thanking Elliot Engel uh, for his work in moving this bipartisan bill forward. The two of us and others on the committee uh, have just returned from Ukraine, and that visit, I think, for all of us underscored the need to reform U.S. international broadcasting. Traveling to eastern Ukraine, our delegation witnessed the Russian propaganda machine, which is now in overdrive, and the attempts by Russia to undermine regional stability. The Russian closure of local Ukrainian radio and television stations, the jamming of uncensored sources of information into the country, all of this demands an effective response. This committee recently worked on legislation signed into law to ramp up programming into Ukraine, but unfortunately, U.S. broadcasters, The Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, and others, are competing with a hand tied behind their back. And that's because the bureaucratic structure over the top of these radios, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, the BBG as it's known, that structure is broken. So while our enemies are working right now 24-7 on their public information campaigns, the organization at the helm of ours meets once a month once a month and often doesn't have a quorum. And that's a recipe for failure. And if we think about uh, some of the witnesses we've heard on this subject, then Secretary Clinton told this committee last year that the BBG, in her words, is practically defunct. Reports from the Inspector General and the GAO have agreed as does nearly everyone with experience in this field, Republicans or Democrats. This legislation makes dramatic changes to the current organization by clarifying the missions of our U.S. international broadcasters, consolidating six organizations into two. One organization, the United States International Communications Agency, will remain a federal entity and will consist of the Voice of America and the associated technical services our broadcasters depend on. And we make clear that the mission of the Voice of America is to, quote, present the policies of the United States clearly and effectively, exactly as was intended. Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, and the Middle East Broadcasting Network, the so-called surrogates, have, of course, a very different mission, to provide uncensored local news and information to people in closed societies and to be, quote, a megaphone for internal advocates of freedom. So whether it's in Iran or North Korea or elsewhere, that's the intention of these surrogate broadcasts. And these freedom broadcasters, as they're known, will keep their names but consolidate into a private, nonprofit corporation that will become the Freedom News Network. Both the U.S. International Communications Agency and Freedom News Network will now have empowered CEOs at the helm and purely advisory boards. Ripping away the bureaucracy will reduce administrative overlap and allow both organizations to thrive 
This legislation also mandates important reforms to the contracting practices to, of the B, BBG and increases public-private partnerships. Unlike decades past, today's media landscape is highly competitive. Other countries are, pr are sprinting forward. We're still standing still. If we're going to adapt, we need a more effective and efficient use of our finite resources, which this legislation lays out through its mission clarification and management reform. And again, I want to thank Ranking Member Engel, who I now turn to for his remarks. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this markup of bipartisan legislation, as you mentioned, that will enhance the ability of the United States to facilitate the free flow of information and share our values with people around the world. Let me say firstly, Mr. Chairman, it was a pleasure to travel with you on our recent trip to Ukraine. We saw firsthand that the competition of ideas and the battle for hearts and minds are alive and well. Over the past few months, Moscow has used its state-controlled media to broadcast totally baseless propaganda that's been used as a pretext for Russia's invasion of Crimea and its destabilizing activities in eastern Ukraine. But Ukraine is far from the only place where objective news is in demand. In Iran, the regime closely controls the free flow of information and has actively jammed U.S. satellite transmissions. And in North Korea, the regime locks radios on certain frequencies to prevent people from listening to the voice of America and Radio Free Asia. Unfortunately, our efforts to disseminate objective news to societies that lack a free media are not as effective as they should be. Last year, a report by the State Department Inspector General found that the Broadcasting Board of Governors, the agency that currently oversees all U.S. international broadcasting, was, quote, failing in its mandated duties, unquote, due to a flawed structure and strong internal dissension. The bill that Chairman Royce and I introduced with support from many of our colleagues on both sides of the aisle will help fix this structure by improving management, enhancing coordination among the different broadcasting entities, and empowering journalists and editors to produce high-quality programming that keeps pace with the rapidly changing international media landscape. Specifically, the legislation creates a chief executive officer to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the new U.S. International Communications Agency, an umbrella organization for Voice of America and Office of Cuba Broadcasting. And it also creates a CEO to run the Freedom News Network, a new organization comprised of the three existing private grantees, which are Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Asia, and the Middle East Broadcasting Networks. The bill also defines the missions of VOA and the Freedom News Network to reduce the duplication of programming and requires robust coordination between the federal and private entities, including the sharing of content and strategic plans to maximize efficiency. Under the new organizational structure, Voice of America, VOA, the flagship of U.S. broadcasting for more than 50 years, will remain the primary source of information about the United States and our culture, while the three grantees that form the Freedom News Network will continue to provide news to audiences about developments in their own countries. Only by working closely together will these broadcasters be effective in providing comprehensive news and information to those who need it most. When I was recently with, uh, with Chairman uh, Royce uh, in the eastern part uh, of Ukraine, uh, we met a lot of people who said that they really would welcome uh, more information uh, from the United States, that they really don't get the balanced type of information. And we know Radio Free Europe and others are the ones that helped the Soviet Union collapse. And so this is a really smart thing for us to do. Lastly and permanent, perhaps most importantly, this bill maintains the requirements that U.S. funding programming serve as an objective sources of news and information and not simply as a mouthpiece for U.S. foreign policy. It's absolutely critical that the news be accurate and seen as credible by the foreign audiences we're trying to reach. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you again for holding this important markup and really for your leadership over the course of many years on international broadcasting issues. This is one ball that you've run with for many years, even before you were chairman of this committee, and it's very much noticed and very much appreciated. And I also 
would like to thank you for working with us on this legislation in a bipartisan manner. I have uh, some votes in my other committee, so I may be in and out, but this legislation is so important and should be passed uh, with, 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 with no uh, dissension because I think this is, this is the type of, of legislation that this committee can be proud of, again, in a bipartisan basis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Engel. Uh, I'll ask now if any other members uh, seek uh, recognition on the underlying bill. Uh, hearing none, uh, we will now move to the unblock am amendment package that was sent to members' offices yesterday. Without objection, the following amendments to H.R. 4490, which all members have before them, are considered read and will be considered on block. The Royce Manager's Amendment, number 102. The Keating Amendment, circulated yesterday regarding women and minorities. Lowenthal Amendment, number 27, recognizing shortwave broadcasting. Rohrbacher Amendment, number 39, regarding U.S. national security objectives and Sherman Amendment number 85 regarding ethnic, cultural, or religious groups within countries of national security interest to the United States. And before recognizing other members to speak, I again want to thank the ranking member for working with me on the manager's amendment, which includes a number of post-introduction corrections, technical changes, and other housekeeping matters. And among other things, it makes it clear that the United States International Communications Agency is a federal organization and requires a plan to consolidate the Voice of America and the International Broadcasting Bureau into that new entity. It also reiterates the mandate that the broadcasters share their content with each other and requires the development of a joint plan to determine how language services will be affected by the clarified organizational missions. Uh, do any members seek recognition to speak on any of the on block items? Mr. Lowenthal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank you and the ranking member for bringing this important bill forward and also for leading our congressional delegation to, the, to Ukraine. It was a, an amazing, an amazing trip where we learned a great, great deal. That trip to Ukraine only further affirmed to me the importance of international broadcasting programs and what a great impact they can have in regions that are desperately crying out for independent news sources. My amendment simply adds the following text to the findings of this bill, quote, short wave broadcasting has been an important method of communication that should be utilized in regions as a component of the United States international broadcasting where a critical need for the platform exists. One of these absolutely critical regions is Southeastern Asia, and specifically Vietnam, which is a one-party communist state that has no freedom of the press. Its people rely upon the trusted news provided by Radio Free Asia, delivered by shortwave broadcasting, a medium that reaches millions of people who would otherwise be uninformed of events in their country. International broadcasting, and shortwave in particular, are key components in promoting democratic societies and for keeping pressure on totalitarian regimes to respect the fundamental human rights of their own people. This amendment reiterates our support for shortwave broadcasting and allows the United States to continue a diversified portfolio of broadcasting to underserved peoples across the globe. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lowenthal. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you and uh, Ranking Member Engel for your leadership in this important reform initiative uh, that I've proudly co-sponsored with you. Public diplomacy efforts are critical to our nation's security, prosperity, and image abroad. Oftentimes, a program on Alhora TV or a tweet from Radio Free Europe may be the only direct communication an individual overseas may receive from our country. In fact, yesterday alone, the Prime Minister from Latvia was here speaking to some of our members, and she mentioned no less than three times about the increase in Russian propaganda on <coughs> Russian-speaking people in her population. In a world where so much information exists, particularly about U.S. interests in society, it's important 
that we do not only put our best face forward as a country, but demonstrate our commitment to the truth and freedom of expression and media as well. I'm pleased that my amendment to prioritize the delivery of information and programming to isolated women and minority populations overseas is included in the Unblock package. Recently, Mr. Chairman, you and I held a hearing on the nexus between promoting education for women and girls and countering violent extremism. This amendment is a byproduct of that hearing and will help close the gap by encouraging more outreach and public-private partnerships to reach women in isolated communities and, in some cases, assist in increasing their access to education and uncensored information sources. In this way, we'll not only be relaying a vision of democracy to other nations, but we'll actually be helping to build such societies by strengthening the civil society engagement and outreach itself. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased that the committee has agreed to include the access to education as a primary component to the democratic ideals of the Freedom News Network aims to support in its report, and I hope that all of us as colleagues will join together in supporting this common sense pr provision in the Unblock Amendment, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Keating. Uh, any other members seeking recognition? Um, hearing none, uh, we, the question occurs on the Unblock Amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, and the Unblock Amendments are agreed to. Are there any additional amendments to H.R. 4490? Hearing no further amendments, the question now occurs on agreeing to H.R. 4490 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The bill as amended is agreed to and without objection. 4490 as amended is ordered favorably reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute. Staff is directed to make any technical and conforming changes. And we now move to the remaining three measures, which we will consider on block, together with the bipartisan amendments provided to your offices yesterday. Without objection, the following items, which all members have before them, are considered read and will be considered on block. H.R. 4028, to amend the International Religious Freedom Act to include the desecration of, of uh, cemeteries. Collins Amendment number 44 Inspire me. to H.R. 4028. House Resolution 520 calling for an end to attacks on Syrian civilians and expanded humanitarian access. Uh, Royce Amendment 101 in the nature of a substitute to House Resolution 520. House Concurrent Resolution 51, calling for the establishment of a Syrian War Crimes Tribunal, and the Smith Amendment, number 51, in the nature of a substitute to House Concurrent Resolution 51. I'll now recognize members who want to speak on the on block items, and I'll begin with myself, uh, because today we're considering two resolutions regarding the crisis in Syria. The first is House Resolution 520, which Ranking Member Engel and I introduced last month in response to the dire humanitarian situation there. Mr. Engel has led on this critical issue for years now, which I greatly appreciate. It has been over three years since Syrian protesters peacefully gathered to call for democratic reforms. Many of you remember uh, the, the protest with the, with the demonstrators asking peaceful, peaceful, as they walked through the, the street before they were fired upon by forces loyal to Syria's brutal dictator, Bashar al-Assad. Since then, the conflict has claimed the lives of at least 150,000 people. It has displaced millions while fueling the expansion of terrorist groups throughout the region. This crisis is a humanitarian nightmare. Backed by Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah, Assad continues to commit mass atrocities, including the extermination of entire families, incidents of ethnic cleansing, aerial bombardment of residential areas with barrel bombs, and even the use of chemical weapons such as last summer's sarin attack on a Damascus suburb. Mm -hmm. The UN has estimated that over 9 million Syrians trapped inside the country are in need right now of humanitarian assistance. 
Yet Assad continues to use international aid as a weapon of war. He has instigated kneel or starve campaigns in which civilians are denied food and other basic supplies until they bow to the regime. This resolution demands that all parties to the conflict in Syria immediately cease attacks on civilians and provide aid workers with access throughout the country. This would include the many Syrian Americans, including medical professionals, who are so bravely trying to provide assistance to those in need inside Syria. It also urges the administration to formally withdraw its official diplomatic recognition of the Assad regime. Shortly after this resolution's introduction, the administration expelled Syrian diplomats from the United States. Given Assad's barbaric slaughter of his own people, and other grave abuses, ending our official recognition of his regime is more than justified. And lastly, this resolution calls upon the President to develop and submit to Congress a strategy for U.S. engagement on the Syria crisis. The other uh, uh, House concurrent resolution, 51, uh, that I was going to com comment on, was introduced by Subcommittee Chairman Smith. We appreciate what strong leadership Mr. Smith has shown on so many humanitarian issues, and the crisis in Syria is no exception. I've, I've always touched on the growing list, I've already touched on this list of horrendous atrocities being committed inside Syria. Assad and his supporting forces, which include Hezbollah, are guilty of widespread human rights violations, summary executions, ethnic cleansing, chemical attacks, and meanwhile, extremist groups, especially associated with Al-Qaeda, have also been guilty of grave abuses as they strive to violently impose their own radical ideology on Syrian civilians. House Con Concurrent Resolution 51 calls for the creation of an international tribunal to hold accountable those responsible for these heinous crimes. The resolution envisions a flexible, ad hoc court like those established following brutal conflicts in Yugoslavia and Rwanda and Sierra Leone. To be clear, this court would be entirely distinct from the International Criminal Court and would focus solely on the Syria crisis. Congressional approval of this resolution will send a strong signal of support to the Syrian people, and I urge members to support its passage here today. And I now turn to H.R. Uh, 4028, introduced by Ms. Ming of New York. The freedom to practice the religion of one's choosing is a core principle of good democratic governance. This freedom includes the ability to gather and pay respects to loved ones in accordance with religious or spiritual rites of passage. Unfortunately, in some places around the world, local or national governments have permitted the destruction of cemeteries with certain religious affiliations or have tolerated their desecration by hateful groups. H.R. 4028 modifies the International Religious Freedom Act to include the, the uh, desecration of ceremonies among the listed violations of the right to religious freedom. This bill emphasizes that Congress views the desecration of cemeteries as constituting a violation of this fundamental right. And I want to thank the bill's author, Ms. Ming, for her leadership on this important issue. And I also want to thank Mr. Collins for his amendment today, which puts the preservation of burial grounds in its proper context. As members know, Mr. Collins has served as a pastor, and we very much appreciate his insight. So uh, do any members seek recognition to speak on any of the on block items. We'll start with Ms. Ming. I would like to thank Chairman Royce and Ranking Member Engel for including H.R. 4028 in the en blanc package of bills before the committee today for consideration. I also want to thank Congressman Doug Collins for his partnership here and valuable contributions to the bill. Thank you to both Republican and Democratic committee staff for recognizing the value of this bill and working so hard to bring it before the committee today. The bill is short, but I believe significant. It adds the words desecration of cemeteries to the violations of the rights to religious freedom listed in the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. There are two related problems we seek to address through this legislation. 
One is the religiously motivated vandalism of cemeteries that occurs with alarming regularity. The second is the building and development over cemeteries in places where there are no communities remaining to protect and look out for the cemeteries. The bill will give our diplomats a new tool they can use to protect our interests. H.R. 4028 also empowers the Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad. This commission was established in the 1980s through legislation introduced by the late Congressman Stephen Solars. The commission works to identify and preserve cemeteries, memorials, and buildings in foreign countries that are associated with the cultural heritage of Americans. The commission has done much work in areas of the former Soviet Union where Jewish communities were destroyed by the Holocaust and where power subsequently passed to atheistic communist regimes. It is essential that we act to protect religious freedom in these areas where, as we know, political instability and anti-Semitism are widespread. It is fitting that we consider this bill during Holocaust Remembrance Week because the bill is largely devoted to the millions who perished in genocides in the 20th century. These genocides destroyed communities and left their burial grounds uncared for and unpreserved. The preservation of cemeteries often reflects the religious tolerance and freedom of the countries in which they are located. It is my hope that this legislation will help promote such preservation and greater tolerance, respect, and empathy around the world. I thank the committee again for its consideration and yield back the balance of my time. Ms. Ming, we thank you again uh, for this amendment. Thank you for, uh, let's see, I think we need to go to Mr. Smith next and then to this side. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for scheduling this important markup and for including H. Conrad's 51 among the bills uh, and resolutions considered. Uh, I, as no doubt all of you, have been shocked by images of horrific human rights violations, including summary executions, torture, rape, and chemical weapon attacks in Syria. Since the Syrian civil war began, perhaps as many as 150,000 people have been killed and more than 9 million people have been forced to leave their homes, 6.5 million of them internally displaced. By the end of last year, it is estimated that neighboring countries such as Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq were holding nearly 3 million Syrian refugees. Who is culpable for these heinous acts and how can they be held accountable, be they members of the Assad regime or Islamist radicals from neighboring countries, those who have perpetrated human rights violations among the Syrian government, the rebels and the foreign fighters on both sides of this conflict must be shown that their actions will have serious, predictable, and certain consequences. They need to know, learn the lesson that Charles Taylor learned, who got a 50-year sentence uh, when he was brought to trial and convicted by the special court for Sierra Leone. H. Conrad's 51 introduced on September 9th calls for the creation of an international tribunal that would be more flexible and more efficient than the International Criminal Court to ensure accountability for human rights violations committed by all sides. Such a tribunal would draw upon past experience, creating a justice mechanism robust enough to hold perpetrators accountable for the most egregious wrongs, yet nimble enough not to derail chances for peace due to rigidity. Beginning with the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals, a body of law has developed concerning war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Since the end of the Cold War, we have seen examples of ad hoc tribunals in the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and hybrid mechanisms such as the Special Court for Sierra Leone. As chair of the Committee on Human Rights, especially during the 1990s, as well as Helsinki chairman, I held a series of hearings on the Yugoslav and the courts that were in Sierra Leone, the two in Africa and Rwanda, and often had the chief prosecutors testify uh, at those, including Carla de Ponta uh, from the Yugoslav court and, and um, um, uh, other members of, of chief prosecutors from Sierra Leone, including David Crane. Well, we brought David Crane back last October 30th to ask him what his view would be on such a court, and he gave riveting testimony, as did other experts, as to the absolute need for the immediate establishment of this kind of flexible court. 
I would note parenthetically that each of these tribunals, the three of them, have achieved a level of success that has escaped the International Criminal Court. The Yugoslavia Tribunal has won 67 convictions, the Rwanda Tribunal 47, and Sierra Leone uh, has won 16 convictions. Meanwhile, the ICC, costing about $140 million annually, has thus far seen only one conviction. All of the indictments have been in Africa, uh, and only one conviction of somebody, lower level person uh, from the DR Congo. One thing we, need, we do not want it to go down, one thing we do not want to do is go down the ICC route. The ICC process is distant and has no local ownership of its justice process. It is far less flexible than an ad hoc tribunal when it can be designed to fit the situation. The ICT requires a referral. In the case of the current president and deputy president of Kenya, it was Kenya itself that facilitated the referral. That is highly unlikely in the case of Syria. Syria. Since Syria is a Russian client state, this UN Security Council member would oppose any referral of the Syria matter to the ICC, but might be convinced to support an ad hoc proceeding that focuses on war crimes by the government as well as the rebels, one that allows for plea bargaining for witnesses and other legal negotiations to enable such a court to successfully punish at least some of the direct perpetrators of this increasingly horrific crimes. And Syria, like the United States, never ratified the Rome Statute that created the ICC, which raises legitimate concerns about sovereignty with implications for our country, uh, which this panel also addresses. There are issues that must be addressed for any Syria war crimes tribunal to be created and to operate successfully. There must be sustained international will for it to, be, to happen in a meaningful way. An agreed upon system of law must be the basis for the proceedings. An agreed upon structure, funding mechanism, and location for the proceedings must be found. There must be a determination on which and how many targets of justice will be pursued. A timetable and time span of such a tribunal must be devised. And there are even more issues that must be settled before such an ad hoc tribunal can exist. Those who are even now perpetrating crimes against humanity must be shown that their crimes will not continue with impunity. Syria has been called the world's worst humanitarian crisis. My right, one might reasonably uh, also consider it's the worst human rights crisis in the world as well. Therefore, the international community owes it to the people of Syria and their neighbors to do all that we can do right now to bring to a halt the actions of those creating this crisis uh, for Syria and the region. Now we have the opportunity to give hope to the terrorized people of Syria. The subcommittee that I chair uh, had a hearing last September 30th where we heard from some of the most experienced voices concerning international justice mechanisms as we have met several times with the State Department and I worked diligently with the committee, especially Ranking Member Elliot Engel and at Chairman Red Royce in shaping a lean, muscular resolution that could be adapted to address this situation in Syria as it currently exists, providing broad latitude for the administration to conduct foreign policy. The suffering people of, of Syria must, uh, must end, and today we have an opportunity to help achieve that. This is a means to that end, and again, those who are committing these horrific crimes need to know that they face certain public punishment. Yield back, and I thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Jerry Connolly of Virginia. Mr. Chairman, because of scheduling, if you don't mind, I'd yield to my friend, Mr. Deutsch. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Royce, for holding today's markup and for your leadership in addressing the Syria crisis. I'd like to offer my full support for HRS 520, which seeks to refocus U.S. policy towards Syria and provide greater access to humanitarian relief to those who are suffering. As my colleagues have noted, there are now 9.3 million people in need of humanitarian assistance, 6.5 million internally displaced people in Syria, with potentially 3 million of those in besieged areas and 2.7 million refugees in neighboring countries. Our e regional allies are struggling to absorb this massive influx. And while the United States has provided over $1.7 billion in relief, funding appeals from the United Nations have been grossly ignored by the international community, with only $1.5 billion of the UN's $6.5 billion appeal having been filled. The conversation surrounding Syria can no longer be just about how we put an end to the conflict. It must be about what we can do to mitigate the immediate effects of this tragic situation on so many innocent civilians. We saw a glimmer of hope when the United Nations Security Council passed a non-binding resolution calling on all sides to respect humanitarian access 
But the terms of this resolution have been largely ignored, as millions are still cut off from food deliveries and basic medical treatment. All of this continues in the midst of new reports that chemical attacks using chlorine gas may have happened this past month. The United States alone will not solve the Syrian crisis, but we must continue to press our allies to act on humanitarian needs. Ending this type of unimaginable human suffering should be a priority for the entire world. But the United States and our reputation throughout the world is strengthened when human rights holds a prominent place in our foreign policy. I'd again like to thank the chair and the ranking member for their commitment to continuing to advance our Syria policy, and I thank my good friend, Mr. Connolly, for yielding. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I want to lend my support, my very enthusiastic support, to both HRESC 520 and H uh, Conrad's 51 uh, companion pieces with respect to Syria. The humanitarian crisis in Syria uh, is uh, almost unprecedented in the region. Uh, we had testimony just a, a few weeks ago before this committee by Ravi Shah, the aid administrator, that the number of internal displaced persons in Syria and the number of external refugees gener generated by the crisis uh, has quadrupled in the year since he testified previously. Quadrupled. We now have 25 to 30 percent of the entire the equivalent population as refugees in Lebanon and Jordan. These are clearly potential sources of destabilization uh, in that part of the world uh, that we can least afford. So addressing the humanitarian crisis, it seems to me, must be a priority for the United States government. And I applaud Mr. Smith for his remarks and for your leadership as well, Mr. Chairman, and for that of Mr. Engel uh, on, on, the, uh, on the war crimes resolution. We do know that that's efficacious. We do know that that makes a difference. And holding out that hope to the victims of this violence that sooner or later they will be brought to justice, we will see to it. Uh, that's what this resolution says, and I think it's a very important cornerstone of our evolving foreign policy with respect to the crisis in Syria. I thank the chair, and I thank uh, my colleagues for their leadership. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Uh, Mr. Dana Rohrbacher of California. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I appreciate you recognizing me for this semi-colloquy. <laughs> uh, because it is, uh, and I appreciate your leadership on the issue uh, that was brought before us in H.R. 4490, the communications uh, amendment and, and legislation that we just passed through uh, this committee. Uh, that present that really is desperately needed reform that has been needed for a long time, and it is my understanding that you are seriously considering uh, including in report language. Uh, the report language that indicates that broadcasting entities should not hire an individual who has worked uh, within the previous six years for the foreign ministry, state-sponsored media, or security services of any country that does not provide objective, accurate, and credible news. Uh, this policy is vital to protect uh, our honest and hardworking journalists and broadcasters from foreign agents acting at the behest of, of hostile powers. This would add, will also add other improvements to the security that this committee has already put in place by passing that legislation. Uh, three years ago, when I chaired the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, the very first hearing I called I looked into the, the BBG, a major problem that we uncovered at that hearing was the lack of effective counterintelligence protection for our international broadcasters. Mr. Chairman, you know what a powerful tool the Voice of America and the freedom broadcasters are for our country. Preventing such people from working for our broadcasters will increase the credibility of our broadcasters and add additional security against efforts by foreign powers to disrupt their work. I appreciate your willingness to include uh, or to consider including language in uh, uh, that legislation, report language, that will uh, deal with this issue. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Rohrbacher for the seriousness that he's brought uh, to this debate over how we go forward with the Broadcasting Board of Governors. Uh, one, of the, one of the specific concerns you have is, of course, the vetting of employees who would be tied to foreign governments. We, we accepted your First Amendment which directly says that foreign agents 
uh, that uh, the employees will be vetted to catch foreign agents of foreign regimes or those tied to advocating terrorism, et cetera. Uh, that may have caught uh, most of what you want to go after. Uh, if there is an additional uh, language, uh, we are happy to try to work with you to work something out uh, as we go forward. This is just the first step in the process. But we did accept uh, your First Amendment Thank you very much. going directly to the point. And I yeah. appreciate your willingness to um, perfect it. <laughs> very good. Well, we will try right. to perfect it. Thank you, Mr. Rohrbacher. Uh, we go now to uh, this side. Any other members seeking recognition at this time? If not, I think Mr. Collins uh, had the amendment. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I would uh, want to thank Congresswoman Ming uh, for bringing this issue of desecration of cemeteries to light. It is, uh, it is good when we can come together, and especially on an issue such as not only religious expression, but also doing so in a very tangible way, I think, is very good. And it's always good to, to reach across and show that we can uh, find common ground, and I appreciate that. Uh, my amendment only adds finding language to the H.R. 4028 to highlight the necessity for Congress to add cemetery desecration as a violation of religious expression. The desecration of the Akaposphar Jewish Seminary Cemetery in Hungary is a sobering reminder of the lack of religious freedom abroad, something that we have here is not universal. Those grounds are final resting place for the deceased and deserve the respect of all regardless of personal beliefs. These acts and others like them around the world show the continued prejudice toward ethnic and religious groups. These attacks affect the fundamental right to freedom of religion, especially when tolerated or encouraged by local or national governments. As an Air Force Reserve Chaplain, I believe expressing your personal religion's belief shouldn't be just a privilege, but it should be a right given to everyone. That is why I'm co-sponsoring uh, Representative Ming's bill and encourage Congress to put its weight behind such a cause. This body is committed to protecting the freedom of religion, uh, including the preservation of heritage of cemeteries across the United States and abroad. That is what brings us to this amendment and also to this fine bill and the work that has been done uh, by Congresswoman Ming, which I commend, and also to the chairman and ranking member. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Pastor Collins. Now, uh, hearing no further requests for recognition, the question now occurs on the items considered on block. These would be the, this would be the uh, bill, the legislation by Ms. Ming on uh, International Religious Freedom Act as it uh, as it regards desecration of, of cemeteries, expanding that. It would include uh, Mr. Smith's bill, uh, the Syrian uh, War Crimes Tribunal uh, legislation, and the Royce Engel legislation on Syrian humanitarian access. So uh, we'll consider that on block. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The measures are considered on block, H.R. 4028. That's it. House Resolution 520 and House Concurrent Resolution 51 are agreed to as amended. Uh, and without objection, each of the measures as amended is ordered favorably reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute. Staff is directed to make any technical and conforming changes. And that concludes our business of today. I want to thank Ranking Member Engel and all of our committee mem members here for their contributions uh, and assistance uh, to this legislation. The committee is adjourned.